Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, July 16th, 2021. To start these videos as I have for the past several weeks, I'm talking about a new story in this collection of Dorothy Parker short stories. This uh, week I read, Oh, He's Charming, which was written in 1926, and it uh, centers around a youngish male author and a fawning young female fan. And the male author is known for writing a lot of women in his uh, books, although I have to say I bet uh, he wouldn't get the same accolades today that he did then in the 20s, uh, 1920s, I should say. Uh, the only uh, sort of real person that he said uh, made it into his books was someone he, you know, des described as charming but possessive and, oh, she's dead now. <laughs> so, okay. And then the rest of it is her sort of... Uh, you know, biting funny criticism of uh, misreading a situation, I think, because, you know, the uh, young woman finds him absolutely charming, and it's clear that he's spending the entire conversation just wanting to get away from her. So, what do you know? I mean, it's deftly done. It's not, like, over the top. But, I mean, so, uh, it was good. <laughs> Next, I finished All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, and, uh, I, I don't feel like I have much more to say about it than I did last week. Hoping I, uh, I'm going to have a good discussion, I think, in my mom and auntie's book club, but it's still a couple weeks away. But yeah, I really did enjoy it a lot. You know, the sweeping history, and you know, we started at Media Res, so you kind of knew where the book would end. And it's, a lot of it is sort of a meditation on connection, I think. Like I listened to some door interviews about uh, using the radio and thinking about how people connect to one it one another, and certainly that's how his two main characters connect, uh, you know, even if they're on opposite sides of the war. But then I listened to the Slate Audiobook podcast, uh, I'll link down below, and uh, I guess I feel more okay only giving it four stars, and maybe the characters are a little too neat and sentimental. They also had trouble, and I guess I also sort of had trouble with the idea of the lack of Jews in the book, but I also have trouble with all of our trouble with the lack of Jews in the book, because it's fair to say that, you know, other people experienced World War II. That's a fact. Uh, and so, is it okay to leave the Holocaust out of this book? And the only real reason that, you know, it might be eyebrow archy is that, you know, with Werner's story, we really do get, you know, into the Third Reich. And so it's almost like, you know, uh, reading an antebellum South story, uh, following a bunch of uh, white boys around, and uh, slavery's only, like, vaguely in the background. You know, that sort of thing. But otherwise, you know, I kind of wish <laughs> maybe uh, they had delved into their own biases a little more about uh, why, uh, you know, we can tell different types of stories. And it's interesting that, I, you know, Dora also talked about, uh, you know, not wanting to tread on something that's already, uh, you know, been so... Uh, covered before and, you know, and uh, not wanting to touch on that particular uh, brand of travesty, and I, I think that's fair. <laughs> so overall, I really did enjoy this. Had to recharge my camera because I ran out of charge. I swear it's not lasting as long as it used to, I don't think. I've had this camera f several years now, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, nobody uh, came here to talk about that. Let's get back to the books. So speaking of historical fiction that's working for me, I have Half-Life by Jillian Cantor, which I finished this week. This is a uh, split uh, novel, really, where uh, we have uh, a telling, more or less, of Marie Curie's real life, and then an alternative life, where um, Cantor imagined a uh, scenario where um, a man that she was engaged to in Poland uh, you know, uh, and then his parents decided he, they didn't like the match and, you know, cut it off. But anyway, in this rendition, uh, the, the, the man, uh, Kaz, comes to the train station where uh, Maria is leaving for the Sorbonne in Paris to study science and become Marie Curie and, you know, p does a last-ditch marriage proposal. And in, uh, one sec in one life, she says no and goes off to become Marie Curie, and in the other, she says yes and stays in Poland to become Maria, uh, his last name. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, you know, on its surface, you would think it's like a meditation on, well, oh, like, you know, a woman could either have a career and have it all, or it could be like a housewife or something, and especially since in Poland at the time, there weren't a lot of opportunities for women, and they certainly struggled, especially in the beginning, 
but it gets a lot more complicated than that. It takes into account all of the real life uh, tragedies and Marie Curie's life, which actually Cantor uh, dialed down on the back on them a lot in uh, the fake life. Uh, Maria lost far fewer people in her life and was able to ultimately uh, gain a career, spoilers, even though, you know, she didn't, you know, discover radium and polonium and all of that. Uh, I don't know, there's some interesting stuff in here. It almost, you know, reminds me of The Space Between Worlds, the science fiction novel, which deals with alternative realities and like, you know, slight variables between people because, uh, you know, between the alternates, because uh, for the most part, like, uh, the characters, uh, even if their, their relationships were different, uh, they ran in the same circles and they still found each other uh, and uh, had some, you know, similar relationships with each other and similar life choices sometimes, although sometimes their circumstances would lead Murray and Maria to behave or, or think differently, especially when it came to family and uh, expectations of their daughters or that sort of thing. So I feel like there were interesting meditations uh, in this book on that. I mean, I don't know how some people would think about the fact of uh, a lot of the same characters reappearing in both stories, like maybe it's a little, you know, destiny or fated, but I guess I kind of saw it more as, you know, they're fundamentally the same person still, so maybe, you know, similar things still happen. I feel like there is a scientific theory about this, but but it's way above my pay grade. <laughs> and really, I think it more is about just uh, the choices we make. That's what's in this novel. And I, I found that compelling. You know, sometimes it was a little over-the-top messaging uh, and uh, exposition-heavy writing, but overall, I, I, I did enjoy this. The next book I finished was also historical fiction, but much more experimental in nature. This is... Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch by Rivka Galchin. Of course, I also listened to it on audio. And it was narrated by Natasha Sudek, which I feel like I should especially mention, because it is one of those books where she does a lot of great acting and emoting, although it comes from Galchin and from the witticisms that she puts into this book. Uh, so to backtrack, this takes place in Germany in uh, the 1600s, uh, and it also it actually follows uh, Johannes Kepler's mother. He was like a famous uh, mathematician, scientist, astrologer of the time period. And while he was busy being famous, his mother was actually on trial for being a witch. And uh, Gelcha decided to lean into this, and she wrote a very short, quick novel. It's mostly um, epistolary of uh, of the the mother Katerina, and also her sort of guardian, a neighbor, uh, Simone, uh, writing uh, letters to each other or to their family members about what's happening. Uh, and uh, it is very witty. There's sort of a, I guess, a anachronistic sense like you know in a vague sense it reminds me like of that uh the apple tv show dickinson which is about emily dickinson but there's a lot of sort of modern affectation to it and there's certainly modern affectation to the the, the narrative of this and it's i don't think how people would uh, necessarily have talked <laughs> in the day but uh it was also like really hilarious writing because you know we're going into why uh, this witch hunt was uh, against her and just sort of the whole, you know, the, the, the cruelty and the gossip and the greed and the envy of the people in town. And I thought it was also uh, telling that I think uh, Katerina also was very gossipy and mean-spirited sometimes, so she wasn't necessarily much better than anyone else. But uh, we really just sort of leaned into that sort of personality trait. So it was a very interesting meditation on human nature and more upbeat than most witch hunt uh, novels might be. Also, you could tell uh, the amount of research that uh, Galchen put into this, and she definitely didn't hit you over the head. It all felt very natural, uh, but there obviously was so much research into you know what life was like in Germany at that time, which was very amazing. So I don't know, overall, I guess I'm still kind of coming to terms with uh, how I think of it overall. You know, it's definitely not a traditional narrative uh, and I'm still trying to get my head around it, but it definitely, uh, you know, in terms of reading something unique, it was really, it was a great choice. Okay, and now I am reading The Lying Life of Adults by Elena Ferrante, translated by Anne Goldstein. Uh, at long last, Ferrante's newest novel, which I picked in my last page 112 tag, which I'll link down below. 
That being said, I am not very far into this at all. Just a couple of chapters, just getting a very uh, preliminary feel of, of the setup, which is interesting to me because, uh, you know, we're starting with a, a girl on the cusp of uh, adolescence and uh, we're talking a little bit about how she's changing. Like, you know, she's going a little bit into like body changes, but also changes into how her parents talk about her and perceive her. And I thought something was interesting that, like, um, apparently her father, you know, gushes to her and uh, talks about her fondly in, in normal Italian. But uh, then she's overhearing him uh, when she's not supposed to be spying on him, talking in dialect about how he isn't so uh, proud of her. And she's starting to struggle in school, apparently. So I don't know. I guess these are the sorts of issues that are um, going to bring this character, I think, on a building's roman of some sort is uh, what I assume, but uh, I'm in early days. I will uh, be finishing this novel, hopefully uh, relatively soon, and I'll be back next week to give my full thoughts. And next in the wings for me is this novel, About the Night by Anat Talshir, translated by Evan Fallenberg. This was the book I chose for the booktube spin that Rick McDonnell is doing on booktube. And I really should be getting to it ASAP because this is my booktube spin number two. And we're already on booktube spin number three. So <laughs> chop chop. <laughs> Anyway, this is a novel that takes place around the Israeli War of Independence, or the Nabka, and it does uh, deal with um, what seems to be a love relationship, a romance between an, uh, beyond enemy lines, between a woman who is an Israeli Jew and then a uh, Palestinian Christian man. Uh, at the time when Jerusalem was then split in two, so they'd be on two different sides of the city, so that's what we're going with here. Um, it is a relatively controversial subject, I would think, in uh, many quarters. And uh, it might not necessarily be done that well. Uh, you know, it's, it probably would take a fair bit to, you know, make this uh, story uh, moving and, uh, and not saccharine or unbelievable or any of those sorts of things. Uh, I guess I'm feeling a little wary in today's day and age, uh, but I'm hoping to... Uh, go in with an open mind and uh, see what I think of uh, how this is done. Uh, I actually do have uh, a post on my uh, one of my blogs I did recently, which posts, uh, which points to uh, literature and uh, nonfiction real stories of, uh, you know, uh, Israelis and Palestinians who, you know, are in relationships, uh, platonic and romantic. Uh, so it's not, you know, completely out of left field. So we'll see how it goes. And I'll link to that blog post down below. Also, coincidentally, in that blog post, I do a mini review of the Shadow and Bone adaptation. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'd like to uh, read those books as well. They could be pretty fun to read, but <laughs> I do have so much to read. <laughs> and with that in mind, I'm going to head off here uh, now and uh, sign off uh, because... Uh, Want to get this uh, posted uh, relatively soon. Have a busy weekend ahead of me. Uh, I have a ladies' brunch and um, part uh, in the morning, to, and to, and then I have um, my new writing literary salon, which I'm really enjoying. We're having a writing session and an open house, and then I'm going to Baltimore for my birthday weekend and my brother-in-law's birthday weekend. So uh, it's going to be a busy weekend. <laughs> Uh, and then once I get back uh, home, I should hopefully be back on this channel soon to do my author's answer for July, so stay tuned. In the meantime, everyone, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.